Hi, everyone. Welcome to the TIPBS podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kay Eyre, and I'm joined by my colleague, Dr. Govind Krishnamurthy. Hi, Govind. Hi, Kay. Hi, everyone. This episode is a strategy share, and we're going to focus on sleep and its role in helping traumatised children learn. Govind, would you like to start us off by telling us about the importance of sleep? Sure, no worries. So um, just to start off very bluntly, um, as a society, we're not getting enough sleep. And we've heard this repeatedly. There's a lot of research on this, and it's been linked to various different things, including the use of kind of smart devices and technology. Um, One of the ways we learn about this is Sealy, the mattress company, do a global sleep census. um, And here are some of the stats that they found up to you know, we're missing up to 700 hours of sleep. So we, we're meant to get anywhere between seven to nine hours of sleep and we're just not getting it. Clearly, Sealy has a conflict of interest here. <laughs> they probably want us to buy some mattresses, um, but we're still not getting enough sleep. Um, and that's particularly true for children as well. Uh, in terms of sleep and trauma, what we know is the sleep's a very, very important part of healing from trauma. So kids who've been exposed to abusive and frightening kind of experiences, um, sleep really helps consolidate those memories and helps with kind of regulating their emotions and things like that. So not getting it um, is a risk factor for developing symptoms, but it's also a risk factor um, for not um, recovering from it. And part of what makes it difficult um, to kind of be able to go to sleep for kids that are traumatized is that they're hyper-aroused. They're kind of constantly anxious and worried. And it's hard for them to calm back down. And they also have other symptoms like nightmares and um, re-experiencing symptoms that usually comes on during uh, night times. So when we look at kind of sleep symptoms, the kind of things you see are insomnia, nightmares, um, disordered breathing, which is a medical issue, but you have movement disorders as well. I've cited a study there, um, looking at um, girls who'd been sexually abused and they found that you know insomnia was found up to 10 years following the abuse so it's pretty significant and fear about bedrooms and sleep you know that's usually where uh, at night times is usually when the abuse and maltreatment happens so those sort of situations always trigger these kids off so the primary thing to help them go to sleep from a psychosocial point of view at least um, is to help them feel safe um, in wherever they're going to sleep so safety is a huge one uh, in helping them go to sleep just a quick note just in terms of sleep um, and how it impacts learning and trauma. Um, so there are lots of different cycles in sleep, and I won't go into all of them, but one of them is called um, REM sleep, which is the random eye movement sleep, which is w- which they're found to be really important when it comes to uh, declarative memory, learning, um, encoding information. You know, this is really when we consolidate a lot of our, uh, the knowledge that we learn in class. Uh, and it's also a time where uh, we consolidate a lot of our social and emotional development and skills as well. So we found that trauma particularly is disruptive to REM sleep. Um, and so, like I said, it kind of perpetuates these symptoms, um, but it also leads to a generalization of fear responses. So, you know, if you are fearful at bedtimes with particular adults, um, not getting enough sleep actually contributes to then that fear generalizing to other adults and um, other kind of situations where it might be dark or similar to when the uh, abuse or neglect happened. Um, so, Kay, did you want to jump in and talk about the first strategy? Yeah, so the first strategy is assess and refer. So I, the most important thing about this is to be attuned into the signs of fatigue in the students in your classroom. So it's about assessing um, how the student's feeling and how much sleep that they've had. So you can do that simply by talking to the student and asking them. Perhaps you can ask their parents or their carers how their sleep patterns are. Do they sleep well? Um, and the other thing is to um, be aware of key events or happenings in the um, student's life that may contribute to disrupted sleep. Um, also, tuning into behavioural cues that might indicate to you that this might be a sign of a lack of sleep. So irritability, um, maybe the the lack of concentration is that they're just so tired. Um, And we all know that we get um, 
um, tired and grumpy and short-tempered, most of us, um, when we haven't had enough sleep. So those, um, yeah, those behaviours can be very clearly associated with lack of sleep. And I guess if we do have a student who we're concerned about who's um, you know, it's been brought to our attention that they are having disrupted sleep and that's becoming a struggle for their concentration and their learning in class that we need to perhaps um, have some discussions with the guidance officer, perhaps talk to the student um, if they're of the age where that's possible and talk to them about perhaps going to see their GP or perhaps talk to the parents and carers about perhaps going to see the GP to sort of get them that extra support about developing really good sleep patterns and habits to help them. So then we'll jump to strategy two. Sure. So this is about sleep hygiene and social, social emotional learning. So sleep hygiene, just very quickly, is basically a term that's used to describe good sleep habits. So from a teacher's point of view, I think what's really important is that we really tend to neglect the whole concept of sleep and how important it is. So we teach kids about, you know, um, food and the right and the wrong foods to eat and we have our green, red and yellow sort of light food and all of those programs and we talk, teach them about road safety and exercise and all that sort of stuff. But sleep is such an important part of their well-being and we tend to not do that um, or focus on that very well. So we need to teach habits about sleep and um, there's some example lesson plans for teachers in the show notes, which I encourage you to have a really good look at. Um, so teaching the sleep hygiene skills, talking um, with the parents and carers about the lessons that you're teaching and making that connection for them about how they can um, implement some of the um, strategies that you're teaching the kids at home and try and embed that in part part of the routine at home so that that connection's made. The other thing there is that part of our teaching social emotional learning is about managing feelings of anxiety with children and just bringing that to the forefront for the children so that they understand the connection between if I can manage my anxiety and and learn to relax and practice relaxation in the classroom well I can do that at home and that will help me to be calm and therefore get perhaps much more uninterrupted sleep time if I have those self-managing skills. Yeah so I think with the SEL skills there's a bit of research suggesting that just targeting anxiety symptoms in itself is actually so it, this is independent of you know giving them any support for their sleep just helping them with the anxiety itself actually has a beneficial effect on their sleep so teaching kids some of these skills is just helpful across the board when it comes to kids who have experienced trauma especially complex trauma obviously this isn't a cure-all but it's a good start for them to start to think about about the kind of things they need to be doing and the kind of things they need to be supported with with their carer. Um, similar to the previous point, um, the, you know, there's SE, you know, social emotional skills deficit might not be the only thing that's contributing them to feeling tired or distracted in class, but it'd be one of many things. Um, and it's quite a useful and powerful thing just to assess and get them some support with. Um, mm. I'll just jump into strategy three. So starting school later. So this is quite a topical one. There's a lot being written and said about this. Uh, it's also a bit controversial. So there's a lot of the research suggests that uh, school start times, particularly in adolescent, uh, conflicts with the circadian rhythm of the kids. So it's not so much that in those youth years that they need more sleep. It's um, more that um, kids need the same amount of sleep at different times of the day. So having a later start of the day actually goes a really long way um, in helping them learn and attend and engage in the classroom. Um, now, Kay, I know you were sort of um, telling me a story about your own kids who had had later school start times. Is that right? Yeah. Um, my children attended a high school where from when the children, well, the adolescents, what years 10, 11 and 12, they started school from 9.30 to 4. So their school day went from 9.30 to 4 and they also had a half day 
off on a Wednesday. So they worked from um, 9.30 to 12, had a very short day on a Wednesday. But the 9.30 to um, 4 o'clock for my own children um, was very beneficial, um, especially when they had worked at their part-time jobs on the Thursday night and they were able to sleep in for that little bit longer before going to school mm. at 9.30. And it definitely, statistically and data-wise, at the high school reduced the late, um, the lateness, you know, arriving late at school, um, you know, uh, by a long, long, long way. So it really did make a huge difference. Great. And for kids with trauma, I think um, because it's harder for them to kind of settle down and go to sleep, um, it might take them longer to go to sleep at night. So you can negotiate later start times as part of the IEP or support plan um, just to help them get that little bit more sleep. Um, look, it could work, it couldn't work, but it's a useful one to try. Um, and I've just put this graphic up because there is a lot of systematic review evidence supporting this. Um, so if you have people who are doubting the efficacy of it, um, do check out some of the research papers we've included in the show notes. Um, I will finish with this. The last one, perhaps the most controversial one, um, is actually providing sleep or nap times. Now, we do this for the really younger kids um, where we have little naps or whatever, um, but doing this with older kids is a relatively new thing. Um, some of the schools in the US have in introduced what they call nap pods so these little pods where kids go to have little naps uh, up to 20 minutes at a time uh, and some of the research has actually found um, that that's actually quite beneficial it helps with their declarative memory it helps with their attention particularly for the older kids um, again like the previous suggestion lots of practical kind of considerations logistical considerations just like later school times are disruptive for parents um, and schools because that's not how it's done um, or that it might cost people, to, you know, time and money and before school care, after school care, fitting in with people's lifestyle. Uh, it is quite a big cultural change. It needs possibly a school-wide approach, um, but it is well worth the while. Uh, for kids who have experienced trauma, obviously having very good parameters around how they use the nap times, when they come out, when and how they get woken up. So we want um, these kids to feel safe. And um, one of the interesting studies I've read in regards to this is um, a study looking at how children sleep in um, mental health inpatient units and what they've actually found is a lot of kids with complex trauma actually sleep better um, because there's a sense that it's a more secure place, it's safer um, and they're feeling more kind of felt safety in these areas um, and part of the argument is that kids who feel safe in school might actually catch up on some of that sleep at school. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's not black and white, but definitely a lot to think about. There's some more research there about how NAPS can help with declarative memory. There's an emerging area of research. That's about it for this one. If you want more um, information about the resource and references to the research we've discussed, go to tipbs.com and check out our show notes. Um, apart from that, we might finish there. Thank you, Kay. Thank you very much. <laughs>